Welcome, everyone. Before we start with today's presentation, Everybody Has a Story, I'd like to make a few quick announcements. Today's webinar is presented by ALA's Public Programs Office with support from ALA's Cultural Communities Fund. To learn more about the Cultural Communities Fund or make a contribution, visit ala.org ccf. Hopefully many of you are familiar with Programming Librarian, a website of ALA's Public Programs Office. We have a lot of program ideas and an online learning library full of free webinars just like this one. Finally, a couple of notes about our virtual classroom. Only our presenter has microphone access, but you are welcome to type your questions or comments in the chat box. We will have time for a Q&A at the end. Also, if you have any technical issues, please send a mess private message to PPO Admin, also known as Colleen Barbas. To do so, hover over PPO Admin in the upper right-hand corner of your screen and click pri Start Private Chat. With that, I would like to turn things over to Cassandra Barnett. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Cassandra Barnett, and as chair of ALA's Public and Cultural Programs Advisory Committee, and a member of the Sarah DeFerian uh, School Library Program Award Committee, I'm proud to introduce today's webinar, Everybody Has a Story, Creating Culture and Historic Preservation Programs with Impact, the program series that won the 2017 Sarah Jafarian Award. I have always believed that students connect better with history when we focus on the stories of ordinary people. Our students tend to believe that history is something that happens elsewhere, not right where they live. That's what drew me to this particular program. The focus is on students learning about the history and culture of their community and its place in the bigger picture. In this program, these third grade students became engaged in the same social studies content as any other students. However, instead of reading a textbook, these students were out in their community, looking at the actual places, talking to people, and researching using local primary sources. This is what brought history and culture to life for these students. I'm willing to bet that these lessons are the ones they will remember and use for the rest of their lives. So without further ado, let me introduce the program's lead cur uh, creator, Amy Harp. Amy is the media specialist at Pilot Mountain Elementary School. She is passionate about creating lessons which are meaningful and teach her students about cultural and historic preservation. Empathy, kindness, and good stewardship are at the forefront of these lessons. Harp has, a media, is, has been a media specialist for the past 16 years and has her national board certification. She enjoys letting her students explore stories that will expand their view of the world. With that, I'd like to now turn things over to Amy. Okay, I just want to talk about our agenda today. I want to discuss how this project developed, how you go about introducing students to cultural preservation, aspects of culture that I focus on while teaching my third grade students, and then local history and preservation, and then at the end we will have a Q&A. So my library is a K-5 public elementary school. It opened in 2010 after serving as a middle school for several years, so it's a remodeled elementary school. I see classes once every two weeks for 50 minutes, which can be a challenge for getting students to retain information. And so this is why I choose a year-long theme for each grade level with standalone lessons to support that theme. I find that if I have a year-long theme, they, they can retain from one lesson to another much better. I'm very fortunate that my school is located right off of Main Street within easy walking distance of our downtown area. This creates great opportunities for community partnerships. The mayor lives two houses up from the school. Our local historian is just a few streets away. The public library is on the same block as we are on. And I realize this is a unique situation, but I hope to show you how you can take advantage of global and local resources in your own community. What I focused on with this third grade uh, year-long theme of was how communities change over time. That is a goal that they have in their social studies curriculum here in North Carolina. And I find with just seeing kids 
every two weeks and being on a fixed schedule, then it can be very difficult to collaborate with teachers. And so I decided to choose this theme to help focus my lessons as well as support the teachers in their goals. I chose the goal of how communities change over time for third grade because I had an interest in learning more about local history. I saw a newspaper article about a local history tour of our downtown area, and I knew the historian leading the tour. She had recently published a book about Pilot Mountain, and she's a retired teacher, so I knew that she was the perfect partner to begin this study. Being so close to town, a walking historical tour would be a great way to learn through experience. So another aspect of this project was the expansion to global learning. After I developed the local history portion of the unit, I wanted to add a global aspect. Our community is not very diverse, and so I have to bring the world to my students. I started finding lessons about how other communities have changed over time and saw a link between this change and loss of culture. There are many factors which contribute to a loss of culture, but for third grade, I decided to focus on the importance of preserving culture. So my purpose became to broaden their perspectives about traditions in other cultures and understand the importance of cultural and historic preservation locally and globally. And overall, my hope is that students will look at people for their story and not their stereotypes because I believe stories connect us. And I want them to be good stewards of their culture and their history. So introducing students to culture can be challenging. Uh, cultural preservation recognizes the many strands of culture, including language, stories, songs, dances, food traditions, practical skills, arts and crafts, relationships to the land and forms of subsistence. Basically, I'm teaching cultural anthropology to third graders, and honestly, they love it. Most importantly, they learn empathy. I want them to make connections and find similarities between themselves and their community and the people that I'm showing them. We begin studying the aspects of culture with language. This is one of the first lessons that I attempted in introducing culture and cultural preservation. Uh, this is Marie's dictionary, and students love Marie. Let's watch a clip, and you'll see why they love her so much. My name is uh, Marie Wilcox. My grandmother delivered me Thanksgiving Day on November 24th, 1933. <laughs> we only had a little one-room house. Grandpa and Grandma always spoke our language, what tell me. I just didn't hear my grandma speak too much English. Mom is our last fluent speaker now since my dad's uncle, Felix Aicho, passed away. When I was growing up, I spoke English. 
I don't remember hearing mom speaking the Wok Chumney language. Mom worked in the fields. We picked a lot of fruit. And I think I missed a lot of school, but I don't know for sure. So that was a little bit about Marie. And as you can see, we get into talking about endangered aspects of culture. The kids know the word endangered. They know that it means that something is going to become extinct, but they don't realize that it can be more than just animals. So when we talk about endangered language, we show Marie, who is the last known speaker of the Wachomni language. And they get to see her story and how she spent seven years working on this dictionary to preserve her language and how now she's trying to record that dictionary and she started teaching classes in her native tribe. They see that she's a real person making a real difference and they connect with her. They, they love watching this. It's a highly engaging video and the Global Oneness Project is a great resource for all things culture. Uh, they have lots more lessons, they have lesson plans and resources available. So it's one that I, I go to, um, but this is one I thought I could use with third grade. Now after talking about language, one of my students told me that her dad tries to speak Spanish to her at home and she always refuses, she doesn't want to speak Spanish to him. But after watching this and after our study of language, she said she was going to start speaking Spanish with her dad and learning her native language or learning Spanish as a second language. So when we talk about endangered language, endangered languages, UNESCO has an atlas of endangered languages. So we pull that atlas up and that helps them see how many languages are on the verge of extinction. I let them choose a dot on the map and we explore the languages to see which, how many people are still speaking those languages. They get to pick which area of the world they want to go to. And then we write down the information and we put it on the world map on the board. The hardest part for them is adding notes to the world map. So, but it does help us practice our map skills. The other resource I have available here is the, about native languages is the ways.org. It has lots of uh, kid-friendly videos that shows how children in the Great Lakes region are being taught their native language. And the kids enjoy that. They get to learn a little bit about why it's important to have your native language be your first language. There's a video about that. And there's a, a video about trying to get the younger generation interested in learning their language. I try to come up with an activity to go along with each aspect of culture. So when I learned that rock, paper, scissors is a game played in many other countries and languages, I included it as part of this lesson. We learned that in Malaysia, it is bird, rock, water. So rock kills bird, bird drinks water, water wears down rock. In Indonesia, it is man, earwig, and elephant. Japan has tiger, village chief, village chief's mother. Vietnam has well, scissors, and leaf. And the kids think this is so much fun. So I asked them to come up with their own versions. The one pictured involved football players. And the students even researched their stats to decide who would beat who on the actual field. And they got to come up with their own uh, motions to identify each football player and then they got to play that. So everybody in the class gets to group together and come up with their own version, so that's a lot of fun. I try to have aspects of culture overlap when I can, so when thinking about dance, I automatically thought of hula, especially as it is so closely tied to the Hawaiian language. So students learn about how the Hawaiian language was banned from use and was kept alive primarily through hula. Many of these resources are just for my background knowledge so that I can explain some things to the kids. Um, 
and much of that information is just way above the third grade level. So I did find this great video about Lilo and Stitch, and it shows students how to be respectful of other cultures when portraying them. So it goes through how the makers of Lilo and Stitch wanted to represent the Hawaiian culture in a respectful way. So after the hula, we start talking about Irish dancing. I use river dance. The students are fascinated by river dance. It is one of their favorite videos from the program. And I, we compare it to clogging to show how aspects of culture travel as people travel. So students can see the similarities and differences in the dances. And I always try to relate things back to our local community. So one of the videos is a local clogging group um, from at the Galax Fiddlers Convention, which is just up in Virginia, just not too far from us. And some of the kids might have been to the Fiddlers Convention, so I'm trying to make connections to them as much as possible. Then they can't wait to try out the Irish step dancing for themselves. So I have a simple introduction video to Irish dancing, so everybody can pick up a few steps. And that's their experience piece for this aspect of culture. It makes it so much richer with hands-on learning. And I've taught this lesson for several years, this year-long um, program, and I keep adding to it as I go along. So this past year is when I added these experience activities for them. So we don't often think about music as being an endangered aspect of culture, but many musical traditions are dying out. Students learn about efforts to preserve these traditions around the world and closer to home. First, I show them, it's a very, very brief video with Mickey Hart, the drummer from the Grateful Dead. And he began to record music from all over the globe. He worked with the Library of Congress to form the Endangered Music Project, which preserves recordings of traditional music around the world. And we look at fun traditional instruments. Uh, we get to we look at that endangered music project and they get to listen to some of his recordings and we talk about how this music is different from the music that they hear played on the radio and we share several different um, pieces of music from around the world that's on that site and then we want to look at some fun fun instruments such as the bones and spoons Let's look at a clip of Dom Flemons of the Carolina Chocolate Drops playing the bones. I'm Dom Flemons, American songster, member of the Carolina Chocolate Drops. I'm going to teach you a little bit about the bones. Now, there are a lot of different ways that you can play the bones, and so I'm just going to show you some of the basics. Well, the first step is put the bones between your finger. That's between the pointer middle finger and the ring finger. You just place them between those two fingers like that. Then you take your middle finger and you squeeze the bone here tightest to your thumb, tighten to your palm. Very similar to chopsticks. And the, now the other bone that you have, this one's hanging loose enough so it's just hanging by itself. And so when you move your wrist, this bone here falls into this one you're holding down tight. So you get one of those and you get one of those. So the next step is getting the triplet. That's something that people really like with the bones, getting this. And so the main thing with the bones is that they, they follow your body motion. And so once you get the hand technique down, this bone out here is just going to sympathetically clack against the one that's near your thumb. And so basically I'll show you the motion here. It's like think of your hand starting up, going down, and then going back up again. And so start it's a... Uh, it starts on the back beat and then goes one, two, three, four, five. So something like that. And so when you put the bones there, once you've got a handle on one set of bones, it's nice to put in two sets of bones. And so basically all you're doing is learning how to teach the other one to do what you've already taught one hand how to do. So you got that, you just got to teach.
Okay, so Don Plemons is amazing, and the students are fascinated by that you can actually play bones. And so I don't have bones. I'm sure that you could probably get some from the butcher shop, and I think that would be really cool. But what I do have are spoons, and there is a video here that shows David Holt um, teaching you how to play the spoons. And when I get the bag out and they hear the spoons in there, their eyes light up and they're like, do you really have spoons in, in that bag? And so I hand out the spoons and we learn how to play um, as much as we can. And it is lots of fun. They at least get to practice it. I also want to share videos of bluegrass because bluegrass is a um, music that is common in this area. It is um, part of the heritage of, of the Appalachian area. So I have a local bluegrass band that I show them, and it's called Shattergrass. One of the kids actually goes to the middle school up the road. The, some of the kids have been on Little Big Shots. They've been on the Today Show. And so I, wanted to see, I want them to see that there are young people who are trying to keep these things alive. And then I show the Carolina Chocolate Drops. They are a North Carolina band who spend a lot of time um, preserving music that, you know, could go by the wayside if, it, if people just forget about it. And that's one of the things we talk about a lot, is if these things are forgotten, then they could be gone forever. Arts and crafts is a fun one. Um, I found a brief video about Western North Carolina's craft heritage. That's a little bit further in the mountains. We're right at the foothills. Um, but I've been interested in preserving arts and crafts traditions since my grandmother taught me how to quilt. Uh, I've also found people to teach me how to, to tat. My grandmother taught me crocheting. So I can bring some of those things in. But when we watch the Sweetgrass Gola Baskets, I really think it, it shows them a little bit about all aspects of culture. And it explains how the Gullah, Gullah culture developed in one generation due to the slave trade. We discuss slavery and how culture, culture will travel and transform itself as it goes from place to place. And it's amazing how they were able to bring their craft over, use what they found around them, and still create these beautiful baskets. And they had to create a whole language, too, so we go back to talk about language again. So our activity for this portion is finger knitting, because this is a simple craft that kids can pick up in a few minutes. Uh, so we watch a video to show them how to finger knit, and it's a lot. Everybody gets yarn, and it's a lot of where to place it on your fingers, and it, um, it is a lot of one-on-one -on -one instruction, kind of going around and monitoring and making sure everybody has their their fingers and their yarn in the right place. But if they get it, they really get it. I had some of the kids saying they were going to ask for yarn for Christmas uh, so they could finger knit more. Parents were telling me that their kids were just making chains and chains of finger knitting. So you can tell they're really engaged and learning something new. Food is usually our first introduction to another culture. I talk to them about, have you ever been to a Chinese restaurant or a Mexican restaurant or an Italian restaurant? And that's, that's something that they definitely understand. Uh, then we talk about how food brings people together. And our food traditions are passed down to us through our families. And I discuss recipes handed down in my own family and how even our favorite family recipes are sometimes lost if no one records them. Uh, my great-grandmother's chocolate pie recipe has been cherished and remembered but so many favorite recipes are lost. One of my students ended up bringing me this sweet potato cake recipe, and she said this recipe was over 50 years old, and you can tell because it calls for yam flakes, which I don't even know that you could buy in the store anymore. So, and at some points I've told kids that if you want to bring in family things like this, that would be great to share, and they do that. But in, when we talk about food traditions, I really want to, them to see how different cultures eat around the world. And I use the book, What the World Eats, by Peter Menzel. I think now it's called Hungry Planet, to show students examples of what is on the dinner plate for people around the world. So this book looks at one week's worth of groceries for a family. 
It's a great discussion starter. When you look at the refugee family for, from Chad, surrounded by a few bags of grain and some bottled water, and they realize that a week's worth of food for this family costs a dollar and 22 cents, you can hear the empathy in their comments. And then we also analyze, you know, which country looks like they're eating more processed food and which countries look like they're eating fresher foods. And it's a, it's a great book to have as like a reference book. Third grade also studies plants, and I like to make connections across the curriculum whenever possible. When we talk about preservation, I want them to understand this can take many forms. So I use the book The Seed Vault by Bonnie Jutner and parts of a TED Talk by Carrie Fowler about the seed bank in Norway. And the Carrie Fowler TED Talk is mostly way above their heads, but I never shy away from sharing with students things that I think might be hard for them because kids will rise to the occasion and they do really well with making those connections. But I do just pull out pieces of the Carrie Fowler TED Talk. So he discusses in this TED Talk how many thousands of varieties of apple trees we have lost over the last few centuries. He says that we once had 7,100 named varieties of apples in the United States. And he estimates in the video that we have lost 6,800 of these. Amazingly enough, our community is within miles of Horn Creek Farm, which is a um, historical farm, and they have over 500 varieties of apples. A man named Lee Calhoun went door to door collecting samples to graft, and he's been on CBS Sunday Morning. I found um, clips to show them of him and other news programs, but he would just go door to door and ask about the apple trees. And he finally collected about 500 in his backyard and he donated those to Horn Creek Farm. So that's somewhere that the kids have been, they've seen, and they can say, hey, we know something that the expert doesn't know. We know there's more apple trees out there than he said in his video. So I also have resources. Oh, the kids, let me tell you this too. The picture that I have here is Master Gardeners teaching students how to graft an apple tree. Um, so the students asked me, how do you graft an apple tree? And I said, I have no idea. And they said, well, how do we find out how to graft an apple tree? And I said, well, I'll see if I can find somebody to come in and show us. So the first people that I approached told me that this is too difficult to explain to third graders. So I said, well, thank you very much. And then I emailed the Cooperative Extension, and they found me two master gardeners who said they would be happy to come and demonstrate how to graft an apple tree. And they were delighted to come out. They brought their trees with them. They showed the kids. I had the whole third grade in the library. And we all learned how to graft an apple tree, and it was great. And the kids were interested because it was their idea to have these guest speakers come. They wanted them there. So I also have resources on ethnobotany. Ethnobotany is the study of how um, native communities use plants traditionally. So I'm trying to show how people are preserving the knowledge of indigenous people and their use of local plants. And I use Mark Plotkin and Lynn Cherry's book, The Shaman's Apprentice. Now, this came about when I found Mark Plotkin by chance on Twitter. He had retweeted or liked something that I had tweeted, and I looked to see who that was, and he was an ethnobotanist. So I messaged him to see if he knew of any resources for children on ethnobotany, since I knew I had this coming up. So he directed me to his Reading Rainbow episode and his book, which I was very excited to share with the students. And by the end of that lesson, I had one little girl tell me that she's thinking about either being a veterinarian or an ethnobotanist. So, of course, I tweeted that to Mark Plotkin, and he said to tell her that we have plenty of veterinarians in the world and very few ethnobotanists. And she and her parents were both thrilled to death that they got a response from, from the author. At this point in the year, we're transitioning to historic preservation by looking at our own community and learning about the history of our town. So we have discussed the ideas of preservation as it relates to culture and how knowledge can be lost if not recorded. So we begin learning about our town's history using a 1939 
video of Pilot Mountain. This video was preserved by the Pilot Mountain Civic Club, and so we can talk about how a group in our own community made sure that this video was not lost, that it was saved, and they went through and um, actually put identified people in the video, and so it doesn't have any sound except for some music playing in the background, but it does have the names of people, and the kids just love that. They, they like to look to see if any of their names are on there. Uh, but when we watch the video, we discuss how people are dressed, the cars, the buildings, and after watching parts of the video, I give students copies of historical photos of our town provided by Carolyn Bowles, our local historian, and they make observations on chart paper. What do they see? What looks familiar? Uh, what is different about this picture than what you see in our town now? After learning about our town using excerpts from Carolyn Bull's book, The Early Days of Pilot Mountain, North Carolina, we prepare for our walking historical tour. Now, when I began this tour in 2013, Carolyn Bulls led the tours. She gradually let me take the lead over the years with her guidance, and now I'm able to lead the tours myself. She still comes to school, and she does some uh, a prep session with the kids, talking about her book and talking about the history of the town. But then she just lets me take them on the tour. So the students are divided into groups. They have clipboards and note-taking sheets with pictures of the buildings we will be discussing. And they are told that there are clues that I will be giving them along the way. So they are very avid note takers. I spend a lot of that tour repeating myself because they want to make sure they get it down on their paper. Sometimes local business owners will come out and tell us more about their buildings. Uh, there is one lady on the corner. She has three buildings that she has preserved. One of them is a primitive Baptist church and she has turned it into a wedding venue. And Usually she's out at least once during that week, and the kids talk to her, and we talk to her about why did she want to preserve these buildings, because she's not really a, a local from our town. She just came and moved here and saw these buildings. One of them was going to be a bank parking lot, so she bought these buildings up and has, has saved them. We always stop by the visitor center to see the high school trophies from the past, old photos, and other town artifacts. For a few years, when we first started, we visited a house where Mrs. Betty Farnsworth shared what it was like growing up and going to school when she was in third grade. Uh, but our groups have gotten too large to continue this, so we can't all fit in her living room anymore, and she really is homebound. Our last stop is to the public library, where they share some of their history, and we complete a breakout activity. Now, a breakout activity is a collaborative, fun way to engage students. And students work together to solve puzzles, to open locks, and when all the locks have been opened, they have completed the breakout and get a prize. So I created this breakout activity using historical books that I have in my personal collection, as well as some that I purchased for the library. And students have puzzles to solve. Some of them can be solved by looking through the notes they took on the tour, some of it's like fill in the blank um, with some letters or some use the table of contents or the index of books. One of them you can see uses an old photo that must be pieced together and then placed on the compass paper that you see there. Each piece of the photograph has a number on the back of it. So if the top piece is number three, then north would be the third part of the combination and it's a directional lock. So they would put, um, you know, there's a one, two, three, and four, it tells them which order to, to go on the directional lock. And so some of them are just um, combination locks, so they'll use the, they might have three page numbers that they have to look up to find out the combination, so they'll have clues to that. So each book has a different set of clues, uh, and each group will have a different book. And that, was, that one was a time-consuming thing. I, we did that at the public library, and if I do it again this year, I'm not sure that I will because the locks can be a little tricky. A lot of them would get stuck. We would have, I would have to go back after school to the library to work on them and to make sure everything was set up for the next day. So 
I like to use the public library, but that might not be the best activity. It would be would have been a lot easier to do it at school and have everything set out and not have to run back and forth to the library. But the public library is always willing to help me. Um, and like I said, it's within walking distance. So they're a great resource for us. This was another thing that I added this year. I really wanted a project. I wanted them to have some kind of product at the end. And so now that we've gone downtown, we've seen the buildings, we've touched the buildings, now they want to spend time recreating the buildings. And students love Minecraft, or at least third grade students do. So they each choose a photo. And like I said, Carolyn Bull, she gave me copies of all of these historical photos. And then they pick their building and they work in Minecraft to recreate that building. They have to use some problem solving in Minecraft because they have to adjust the tools. They have certain building materials. Um, they, everything's in squares, so to try to make the roof angles, it can get a little bit difficult to make it look realistic. But the kids can work that out. They play Minecraft all the time, so they know how to do a lot of this. And I did not know how to do a lot of this. So they really were on their own for the most part. They helped each other. We had lots of my experts uh, that would help go around and help people if they needed help. But you have to set up rules when you're in Minecraft because they are in this world together and they are working in the same world, but they can work on their own building or they could have collaborated and worked on a building together. So I remind them that if they wouldn't do something on the playground, then they shouldn't do it in Minecraft. You do have to establish these clear rules at the beginning because they do um, get angry at each other. He's in my building, or he broke my block, or he dug a hole and I fell through and I can't get back out. So there's a lot of that that you have to, to be aware of. But it is a great way to use primary source photos in a, in a fun, um, new way for the kids. And they did a really good job. So ways to get started. Make connections. Uh, contact your local library to find out about any historical organizations in your area. And I'm just always on the lookout for things. I look in my local newspaper. I saw an article about the African American Historical Society in the newspaper. So I said, oh, I'm going to call them. So I called them and they came out and have talked to kids uh, in the past and I may want to use them for my fourth grade too to talk about North Carolina history. And usually people are pretty good about saying yes, they would love to help. Twitter is a great resource or even Facebook. We have a, there's a Facebook site for our county that has historical photos on it. So that would be a great place to get some primary source photos if you didn't have somebody like I do, a local historian who's just going to provide them for you. So that Facebook site has some things that I could print out and use. And think about your town. What's unique about your town? We have this beautiful mountain, and our railroad made us an important stop for many years. And that's one of the things that kind of got us started. We had a story in Scott Forsman called Boomtown. And when I was talking to Carolyn Bull, she said, well, we were a boomtown. We had this railroad, and everybody came through Pilot Mountain which is a town of about 1,200 people. So we have a 50-room hotel back in the 1800s. It was, a, it was a big, booming place. There were some um, mineral springs, and then they had lots of advertisements about trips up the mountain. And the fun thing is you can find a lot of these old advertisements on newspapers.com. We have a grant through Ancestry.com, and... We get newspapers.com and military records and ancestry.com as well. So that would be something worth looking into. Sometimes we have issues with, with it in our server and it doesn't always work, but when it works, it's really a great resource. And the kids can get on there and look at research. Like we've had several fires in our town over the years, so they can research those fires. And the kids love finding new things and sharing things that they didn't know or that I might not have known. And then Minecraft or Maker Projects. I was trying to bring in more Maker-type activities for the kids this year. And Minecraft you do have to pay for, but um, we have 
Lucas Gillespie is our director of, of technology or digital learning, and he's big into Minecraft, and so he helped me get that aspect started. He, he was there the first day that I launched Minecraft with my kids. Okay. So, and I would be happy to help anyone that needs assistance trying to get this started in your own community. So I guess we will take any questions now. Yeah, um, thanks Amy. So um, we have about 20 minutes left for uh, Q&A, so go ahead and type your questions in the chat box and we will read them off. Um, while people are typing, um, Amy, could you talk about if do you guys have a budget for this um, program or is it um, completely? No, there's no budget. <laughs> I was trying okay. to find it. It's just all free stuff. I mean, the, that's one of the great things about having a walking field trip is that we didn't have to pay for buses and we didn't have to pay for any of that. Uh, I mean, I, I purchased books out of my book budget, but one of the historical books was donated by the African American Historical Society. They donated a book to us. And so some of the books I've purchased just with my regular library budget. And then, like, the yarn and stuff is donated and the spoons. I'm going to have to go buy more spoons at a thrift store. So, but no, it's a really cheap program. And like Ancestry is free, and it, they really just need you to send in a little blurb and they'll get you on um, for that grant as well. And, sh and Minecraft, our county paid for. Have you researched oh, okay. programs for different ways of making a living? There. I'm not sure exactly what you're saying, but there is one lesson that I do on salmon fishing. And we talk about how we don't have traditions for salmon fishing because we have no lakes or anything around here. But that was on, let's see, that might be in the Global Oneness Project too. Um, but we talk about how they're trying to save their traditions, uh, their fishing traditions, and how some of that is going away because of um, how the jobs are leaving that area. So it's really hard for them to continue to make a living with fishing. And we talk about how culture has a lot to do with where you live. The types of cultures um, that we've discussed has to do with where you live. I hope that answered the question. Great. Um, anyone else have anything that they would like to ask Amy? And while you're typing, I just want to say that I did not even consider applying for this award. I suggest that anybody thinks that they have anything that's remotely um, applicable to this award to apply. I had a friend that said, you need to apply for this award. I was like, I don't think that this would work for me, but I went ahead and applied and I'm really glad that I did. Yeah, and um, dovetailing off of what Amy said, uh, the round for Jafarian will open up um, in January this year, so um, keep an eye out for that, and we invite anyone um, with the Humanities program to apply at the school library. Okay, so... Um, so, yep. uh, uh, so um, Someone is wondering how long these programs on a day-to-day -day basis take, and um, do students come to the library and participate in this for an hour a week or 30 minutes, etc. Okay, I see classes for 50 minutes every two weeks. So one week I will have um, kindergarten, first and second grade in the mornings, and then I have a flexible afternoon. The next week I will have a flexible morning, and then I'll see third, fourth, and fifth grade in the afternoons, 50-minute classes. Um, for schools that don't have a um, access to Minecraft, is there a different um, thing you recommend that they could use either online or in person to have students build their own uh, town? I would do a scrap town. Those are really fun and they just take recycled materials and they can create the whole street 
and they can each do a building out of cardboard and paper and whatever popsicle sticks things like that uh, we've done some scrap town activities and those can be a lot of fun and they don't take a lot of money and you can get donations for those as well just to get parents to donate recycle materials and some of the there are there's a project similar to that at our visitor center that some high school students did and they created the buildings and I think they made like wooden buildings or popsicle stick buildings very cool um, so do the students present on the their um, towns afterwards or do they build it and then kind of just get a play in the Minecraft world yes I didn't have them I didn't have them present we start running out of time and lots of things start going on towards the end of the year so uh, we're kind of here there and everywhere so we're trying to just get finished with building the, the buildings okay there's a sketch up well that'll be fun too the free version but I would like for them to do more I will print sometimes I'll print their their things and I'll put them up so other people can see them especially to give students who are having a hard time an idea of what other students are working on but they can still they can fly around and look in Minecraft and see other people's buildings very cool um, so it seems like uh, our questions have come to an end um, so with that, um, I think we will let everyone go. Um, a huge thank you to Amy for this presentation and of course to all of you for joining us today. Um, this webinar will be available for viewing on programminglibrarian.org within a couple of hours. Thank you.